Hello and welcome to Bloke on the Range. Now, uh, I'm here getting buffeted by the wind, so I hope the sound quality's okay. And just for good measure, there's a guy with a strimmer down there just to top it off. Now, uh, no guns today, I'm afraid. Bit of a geography lesson, so get your coloring pencils out. Now, what we're up here for is, uh, I'm actually standing on the first fold of the Jura Mountains above the town of Neuchâtel to talk a bit about Swiss geography and how that affected the sort of geopolitics during the First and the Second World War. Now what we're doing here is still of the um, superficial level, just a bit of a summary, just to try and get a bit of appreciation of what's going on. And to help me here, I have my superb didactic three-dimensional topography map, which will hopefully give a bit of uh, assistance in visualizing what's going on. Now, as I said, I'm standing on the first fold of the Jura Mountains, over there in the background, and unfortunately it's not as clear as I'd hoped, over the other side is the Alps. Now, it's a common misconception that Switzerland is mountainous. Yes, Switzerland is mountainous, but only 60% mountainous, which is still quite mountainous, but it's not the sort of uh, chocolate box vision of Switzerland, of, uh, of the Bernese Alps with these uh, cutesy little wooden houses like around where I live. And a lot of the footage I've shown of Switzerland has been that sort of area. Now, whoa, not only is it windy, I can't actually see the viewfinder. Uh, right, wait for the next lull. Okay, so I'm standing up here in the Jura in the first fold and the Alps are in this great big swathe across the south of the country. Now, uh, just a brief uh, recap for those who are not totally au fait with European geography. Switzerland is landlocked, so it does not have a coast. Oui. France runs uh, around this side of it, got the French Alps, Lake Geneva. France runs all the way up to here. Basel is the uh, three country point. Then you've got Germany, the old black forest there. Germany goes around there, and then you've got Austria. Coming further around, you've got Italy. Now, uh, linguistically, I'm in uh, French-speaking Switzerland right now. So this section, roughly, most of it's German-speaking. Uh, Second World War era, we're talking about just over 70%, to roughly 20% French-speaking. And then south of the Alps, down, where are we? Down here, uh, is Italian-speaking, was about 6%, and there's a small amount of Romanche up there in, uh, in Graubünden. Now, the interesting thing is not the Alps. This is obviously good defensive territory. This is where the uh, redoubt strategy comes in, and that's something we'll get onto in a lot more detail later. It's the central plain, which runs from Lake Geneva in a big arc through the middle of the country, past Zurich, and ends at Lake Constance with Germany. And you've got all the border with Germany here. It's only slightly hilly. It's the Black Forest. And that goes on to Basel. France, for the French to get in, they've got to come in th through Geneva at the end of the plain or across the Jura, where there's uh, not that many good high capacity routes through. Now, if we look at World War I to start with, the front was actually at this point here. There's a little duck's bill of land there on the Larg River. And uh, there was a great fear throughout the war that either the French would try to come in and get around the front line into Germany that way, or the Germans would come in and do try and do the opposite. Now I think tactically and we and strategically probably um, the French would have had an easier time of it because their exit is on a wide front. Uh, the Germans had a big entry, as the extra said to the bishop, uh, and their exits are very, very few, relatively few points. I mean, certainly if you're getting away from, uh, from the front, you've got relatively few points across, across the Jura and then down the bottom in Geneva. And I apologize if I'm cutting myself off. The sun is right there in my face and I can't really see the screen very well. So, that's the First World War situation, essentially. Um, First World War was not an ideological war, various reasons for it, but it was essentially a uh, massive screw-up of, 
of uh, mutual defense agreements and the French wanting a good whack to uh, reclaiming Alsace and Lorraine, which they'd lost after the Franco-Prussian War in 1871. And the Germans wanted to have a pop at the French again because that's what they did. Um, there was a pretty much an equal risk at various times in the war that either the French would come in to try and get around the Germans or the Germans would try and come in to get around the French. And there were written agreements in place. The, the rule was basically whoever attacks us first is our enemy. This is entirely reasonable. Um, now the whole history of Swiss neutrality it actually goes back until to the, to the post-Napoleonic era uh, founding of the modern Swiss state in the uh, 1820s, if I remember rightly, um, where Swiss neutrality was built into the constitution and they take it very, very seriously, like, the, like most Americans take their constitution. It's a, it's a major part of the sort of, well, not really the founding myth, but sort of the, the, the part of the ethos of the modern Swiss state. From, from that period onwards. And interestingly, the, uh, the modern Swiss state was built up along American lines, more or less, as it was at the time. And it's just diverged a bit, but there's certain similarities still. Anyway, end of tangent. Um, so, during the Napoleonic period, the French had done exactly that. They had marched through Switzerland, through the plain, to get at Austria. Because Napoleon wanted to have at Austria. Napoleon had wanted to have at everybody. Um, but the Swiss were in the way, the small cantonal uh, cantons the equivalent of a state, a US state or a German Bundesstaat. Um, the cantonal militias were just no match, hopeless, Switzerland occupied, not much fun. Anyway, so uh, Switzerland, Swiss neutrality has been basically a, a to form a buffer zone between France and Austria. I mean, Belgium was a buffer zone between France. And, there's buffer zones between France and lots of people because of what happened in the Napoleonic era and prior to that. But uh, yeah, Swiss neutrality guaranteed by all its neighbors as a buffer zone, which seems vaguely sensible. Now, World War II is a bit different. World War II is an ideological conflict. Um, World War II at the start, 1939, the risk was purely from Germany, trying to get around the Maginot Line. The Maginot Line is sort of extending up here, this way, to the north. Um, it's an enticing route to get around the bottom of it. There was no risk of the French infringing Swiss neutrality to get to the Germans. The French, aside from a few little minor and kind of pointless incursions into uh, southwest Germany in front of the Maginot Line uh, during the early, very early phase of the war, the Phony War, I mean, the, the there's these, these sort of little incursions and nothing really happened, nothing really came of it. There wasn't much resistance and they just sort of went back and they weren't prepared. The, the, the Maginot mentality, they weren't, they weren't prepared to go, right, we're going to smack you guys. And probably a massively lost opportunity, but they weren't ready. The Brits weren't ready. No one was ready. They weren't prepared to do it. They wanted to sit in the Maginot line and refight World War One on a defensive uh, basis, essentially, but with tanks and stuff. Modern, modern for the time, tanks and stuff. So, in World War II, early phase, the risk was that there would be German incursion on a broad front up here, come through, get behind the Maginot Line, get at France. France, there was actually, there was actually, and this is not well known, there was a written agreement in place with the French. Uh, in case of German infringement of Swiss neutrality, German invasion of Switzerland, in the early stages of the war, and this is something we'll get into in much more detail later, the Swiss were just going to hold on until the French arrived. Now, um, there was no opposite uh, reciprocal arrangement with the Germans, pour la bonne forme, because it never really got that far. There were, there were talks just trying to get something in place just to prove that they weren't massively biased towards the Allies, but they were massively biased towards the Allies. This was known, this was obvious, the French weren't a threat. Um, by the time they got around to sort of getting something in place for, for the good order, um, to show willing, as it were, to show that they were being neutral, um, France had fallen, there was no point to it anymore. Now, when France fell, there was a big trainload of, um, of French military documents discovered at La Charité sur Loire, which included the written agreement between the French and the Swiss. Now, the Swiss um, knew that the Germans had got this because the Swiss uh, espionage setup was extremely effective. 
and reached all the way into the Reichskanzlerei in Berlin. Uh, so the Swiss knew, the Germans knew. The Germans never leveraged it actively. I mean, the, 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 the Germans knew that the Swiss knew that the Germans knew, as it were. It all gets a bit meta. Um, but they never actually lever leveraged it. And I suspect that what they were going to do was that um, if they decided, right, today we're going to do it, we're going to invade, they were going to leverage it at that point and say, look, we've, oh, look at this uh, scandalous, uh, the, the perfidious French, uh, uh, sorry, perfidious Swiss uh, infringing their neutrality with the French. We've discovered this, this is horrible. We need to invade them. So, um, yeah. What this brings us on to now, after that rather longer than planned brief summary, is what is the impact non-militarily, not directly militarily. Now, if we look back at the map, as I mentioned, 60% of Switzerland is mountainous and the other 40% of it needs to produce food. And uh, I had someone in an earlier video ask me the question of, uh, of how the Swiss fed themselves with so little flat land. And the answer is they didn't. They still don't. I think probably since the Middle Ages or, or sometime between the Middle Ages and the early 19th century, they've been net importers of food. And in the pre-war period, it was actually uh, of the order of pushing it depends on who you ask and how you count it, around 70% of food was imported. And this is, a, this is a massive, massive deal because this eliminates a choice that the Swiss might have had had they been self-sufficient in food, which would be to seal themselves inside their own borders, put their fingers in their ears and go, la, 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 we're not listening, talk to us when it's done. Not possible. That results in starvation in a matter of months. This means that they have to trade. During the early period of the war, before France fell, it was easy. They could trade with the Germans and the French. And uh, if they had decided to only trade with the French, that was an, they were infringing their own neutrality and the Germans would leverage that. Um, it was basically you, 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 you trade with everybody or you trade with nobody. And trading with nobody isn't an option because you'll all starve. You'll also freeze because um, this was largely a coal-driven era. Switzerland has basically no coal. Um, almost none, uh, so little, not economically viable. All of that had to come in from foreign. Uh, Germany was a net coal exporter. It was one, it's one of the few raw materials that they had in absolute abundance. So practically all the coal had to come from Germany or through France before it fell or come in from overseas. Which brings us to another point. Overseas, well, it's one thing when, uh, when, when, when France was still independent, yeah, they had a way out. Uh, in fact, um, the Swiss merchant navy used the port in Genoa in Italy, um, but they had access to Marseille and uh, access via rail to Spain and all that. Uh, the, the demarcation line, the border with Geneva fell down here, fell into, uh, into Vichy France, so until Vichy France was occupied by the Germans in late 1942. There was one high capacity train line out here that could go down to Spain or Marseille or whatever. Once Vichy France has been occupied, the, they're done. They cannot get anything in or out in quantity without, without the permission of the Germans or the Italians. And in 1943, Germany uh, occupied Italy. So Switzerland was entirely surrounded by not just Axis, but German-controlled territory. And if you're wondering about Austria, well, that had ceased to exist in 1938 after the Anschluss, when they were uh, encouraged, in inverted commas, to join the Reich. So that was all Germany. Um, now, they saw war coming, and with respect to food supply, they they had been working on this, they'd been increasing the amount of agricultural land in production, and actually they did a really good job of this. And uh, the stats I've got from, from uh, 19, the decade from 1934 to 1944, the, um, the, the number of cultivated hectares was increased by 99%, which is as close to a doubling as makes no difference. I mean, this is pretty impressive. Basic principle was that at any time the Germans could starve or freeze the Swiss into submission by cutting off food, cutting off food import, cutting off coal import, 
and they would do this occasionally to extract concessions. So suddenly they'd find that a, um, that a coal shipment would be delayed or, uh, or uh, a shipload of grain. I mean, grain was a big one. There was only about 40% of, uh, of the grain needs were met locally. So that all had to come in from Germany or through German controlled territory. Now, as a neutral, under the 1907 Hague Convention, the, um, if I've got that wrong, I'll correct it. I'm doing this all from memory. The, um, the Swiss, as non-belligerents, had a right to trade with belligerents. They could even trade arms as long as it wasn't state arsenals doing it. Now, um, this was leveraged slightly by the Germans, um, who insisted on trading with the Swiss because they wanted precision manufacturing. I mean, uh, the Swiss economy at the time was 21% of the workforce in agriculture still, which is actually fairly high for a modern economy. Uh, the US at the time was 18%. The UK, including fisheries, was six. As the UK uh, had its industrial revolution, started the industrial revolution early, uh, was a much more developed economy. France was more rural, that was over 30%. Germany about 25%, much more agrarian. Um, up there, but you had 44%, if I'm right, um, of the workforce working in manufacturing, high value goods. So essentially, to be able to trade for food, they needed to export high, uh, high, high value add manufactured goods. Some of these manufactured goods, precision, uh, precision uh, engineering, machines for making other things, um, armaments, uh, a lot of it's watchmaking related. So uh, not only clocks and watches themselves, but jewel bearings, which are used in, uh, in aircraft instruments and things like that. Um, interestingly, uh, a lot of them were smuggled out to the Allies <laughs> because they're, they're small. They're literally people smuggling them across the border, getting them down to Spain, to Portugal, onto a ship or a plane and back and, and up to the UK. All these little minor tangential asides. Um, anyway, the big, uh, the big point was that the Swiss had to trade with somebody to be able to get um, food and fuel. The more they could source and produce locally, the less they had to trade with the outside. So not only was the, uh, the agricultural production ramped up as far as possible, they were always net importers of food throughout the war, but the less dependent they are on stuff coming from the outside, i.e. from or through the Germans with German permission, um, the the less leverage the, leverage the German, the less leverage the Germans had over them because they could survive longer. It wouldn't just be a case of uh, cut off coal supply for a couple of weeks in winter and everyone's starving and begging for mercy. So on the fuel situation, they would exploit the little coal that was in, in the top end of my valley. They were digging really low value brown coal over that way uh, towards Teufel and they, were, they, they gave permits for cutting peat, which is pretty uh, highlands and islands of Scotland and pretty, pretty medieval fuel source. There's anecdotes of uh, factory workers being sent out into the forest to, to collect pine cones. They went to a lot of wood. They were making charcoal, the pit medieval again, as a, um, as a substitute for coal to, to minimize the leverage the Germans had over them. And they knew that the Germans could invade them at any moment on any pretext. They had, they knew they had that piece of paper where they had an illegal and inverted commas agreement with the French for uh, assistance in case of German invasion. And there's also, as another thing they could leverage, they could, uh, they could shut off fuel and food and then make it a humanitarian intervention. And they're perfidious sods, so uh, we wouldn't put anything like that past them. So in any case, the, 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 the Swiss survival relied on exploiting their resources as best they possibly could. Um, in terms of other resources, Steel, well, iron, iron ore, no, nope, none, copper, none. That all had to come through. Now, to get back on the point of, of the right to trade with belligerents and other neutrals, once Switzerland was surrounded, they needed the Germans' permission to do so. In fact, they needed the Allies' permission to do so as well, because there was a double blockade. There was an inner blockade on land, by virtue of being surrounded, and there was an outer blockade on the sea. Um, so, so Swiss goods from South America, North America, um, British, uh, British Empire, uh, Africa, any, any neutrals like that. There was a system of double permitting where it was permitted that 
the Allies wouldn't sink it on the high seas and the Germans wouldn't sink it on the high seas and then the Germans would let it dock in Genoa or Marseille or wherever uh, and then let it come into Switzerland by train and the Swiss managed to negotiate sufficiently uh, strongly with the Germans to allow them to do that. So, I mean, Swiss manufacturing was, was running on raw materials that had been sourced from the US. Now, once the US joined the war, their attitude towards their formerly co-neutrals uh, hardened. Um, but they needed basically everything that came in to Switzerland in any quantity that wasn't physically smuggled over the border in someone's jacket um, had to come in with the permission of the Germans. So the Swiss were leveraging the fact that the Germans were leveraging the Swiss's uh, neutrality to get access to their manufactured goods. And, and so the Swiss, okay, this is basically uh, Alinsky's fourth rule being used in a circular fashion. Okay, you're, you're saying you're neutral. Okay, then uh, you have an obligation to trade with us because if you're refusing to trade with us, you only want to trade with the Allies, then that gives us grounds for war because you've infringed your, your, your neutrality. And this was going, yeah. okay, okay. Um, but you know that if we trade with you, that means we have to trade with the Allies, which means that you have to let us import stuff from the Allies. And it also means that you have to let us export stuff from to the Allies. So the general principle with this permitting was that as a general rule, they, neither side wanted their raw materials to come into Switzerland, be manufactured into war material that would then be used by the other side. And as a general rule, that was held to, but there were certain minor exceptions, which were sort of tacitly mutually agreed on. Um, I mean, we're talking very, very small, specialized components that couldn't, specialized material components that couldn't be used else, elsewhere. But there was a certain amount of, of allied raw materials that ended up in German weapons and vice versa. Now, it's also it's, it's not the case that the Swiss were making K31 rifles or Mauser 98s for the, for the Germans. I mean, Ehrlichen cannons we're talking about here. Um, certain German firms to get around uh, Versailles Treaty um, restrictions had set up in, um, in Switzerland. So you've got the, the, the Solitern anti-tank rifles. The, that factory was owned by Rheinmetall. In fact, um, a lot of the interwar commercial Mauser production that was shipped, say, to China and to Japan for a while at the same time, uh, was shipped out via Constance. They were, for the final assembly was in a, in a random factory in Constance uh, up here. Um, and uh, I, find, I find this whole thing extremely fascinating and how this was, how the Germans leveraged the Swiss and the Swiss tried to get the best deal for themselves as well while remaining neutral. And, what I want to get into to a certain degree is uh, is some of the, some of the some of the sort of revision is the, the the war was massively costly to the Swiss, massively costly to the Swiss. And people go on about banks and what have you, but but it, it was massively costly to the Swiss. I mean, the amount of money they had to they had to plow into uh, into armaments, into defence for all the all the um, uh, the bunkers and things, and. The irony, the great irony of all this is that all of the steel that went into all the weapons to defend themselves, the steel that went into the bunkers, the, uh, the, the, uh, the concrete that went into the bunkers, I mean, there's plenty of limestone here, don't worry about that, but to make the cement, to make concrete, you need coal, because you need to heat it. So, but that all has to come from Germany. So the Swiss couldn't actually defend themselves against a possible German attack without trading with Germany, with the Germans, and the steel that was in the Swiss weapons that would have fought against the Germans had they invaded was German steel. Um, and it's this incredible paradox that, that they couldn't have, if they just sealed themselves inside their border and let's just forget them, the whole starvation and freezing to death thing, they, they couldn't have defended themselves because they didn't have the German steel to defend themselves against the Germans. So um, it, it really was, uh, even even in this this neutral area that could have been invaded at any time, it was it was a, a a struggle for national survival, anticipating that an invasion could come at any moment. So I'm going to see if I can brave the wind and show you a few other random interesting uh, things. Now let's look a bit of the strategic situation here. Where, as I said, on the first the first fold of the Jura, there's Neuchatel down there. Um, and this is a great big long ridge that goes all the way along there down as far as Solitern. That That's west, that's the direction of Geneva. That little fold there is uh, the Val de Travel, that's one possible entry route. It's fortified all the way along, it's really quite fascinating. 
Um, so the central plain extends sort of as far as the eye can see up to where you see the mountains. You've got the uh, the, the uh, Fribourg uh, pre-alp pre-alps there. And I'm sorry if I'm not pointing in the right place. This little screen and the sun is a bit of a problem. You've got the Alps over there under a storm, so I'm, I'm expecting it to be raining when I get home. You've got Lake Neuchatel down there. You've got um, Lake Merton there. Montvuy. Lake Beale and the Jolimont. Now, Montvuy is fascinating from a World War One perspective because what it did, they, they built some positions on it. There's actually an old Iron Age uh, Helvetic hill fort up there. Um, it dominated on both sides the ground between the lake, and there's a fascinating eight gun uh, uh, machine gun position built into the living rock on the far side, and there's various inf infantry positions, and they could basically uh, hinder anyone marching a big army up between the lakes and there's other fortifications on the other side. This is interesting because in World War I that, that was important because, because of the logistics of the time. Uh, everyone walked, it was all horse drawn. You'd want to march people through there ideally. Um, but it wasn't important in World War II. It wasn't built into the, uh, the World War II defensive plan aside from an aircraft observation post on the, on, the, on the high part of it. What was built into World War II defences and this is this is where they they, they used the um, uh, the topography as best they could now you've got a canal joining that lake to that lake runs along there you've got a canal joining that lake to that lake that runs around the, the uh, Montvue there and there's a big stop line that runs from Gampelin at the western end of the Jolimont that's that mountain there down to the lake and you've got another one from Erlach, which is right at the other end, and down to uh, down to the other lake, just a little little one there, um, to stop tanks. There's no point in over there. It's not interesting once you're in, once you're into sort of tank warfare period. Much more mobility uh, with a, with with a greater number of troops riding to uh, to war. And interesting in 19, interestingly, in 1939, the only European army that was fully motorised was the Brits. Germans weren't, uh, French weren't, Swiss definitely weren't. Um, so there's a massive anti-tank obstacle there. The bridges over the, over the canal, some of which weren't there at the time, would have been blown up. So using the lake, connecting it all up as far as possible, deliberately give everyone a hard time. And this was really uh, in view of Germans coming in from France, from the Val de, Val de Travers, or up from the uh, Lake Geneva area, around this side of the lake here. And it was a stop line, it was a hindrance line. The Reduit is in the Alps over there. And there's just a series of these, of these stop lines that were to be held to the last bullet and bayonet um, and so on. But you can see actually from here, looking down onto the plain, quite how much agriculture there is. And at the time they were basically planting every single square meter. So if we zoom in there, it would be even denser than that at the time, planting right up to the roads and uh, and so on. Now I know this has been long already, um, but just one last point I wanted to get is sort of the geographical overview is that when looked at from the German perspective, so if we look at it from Germany, Switzerland has its back to the Alps. All that's interesting for the Germans from an economic perspective, it's all in this arc. I mean, it's like 80% of the population almost all the industry, almost all the, uh, the agriculture is in this arc. So if you look at it from their perspective, it doesn't look as formidable. And this is why the Reduit strategy came in. It was to make it formidable, to say, okay, we're just gonna stick everything in here and uh, make, you, make you work for it. That basically you're just gonna get a big problem. Looked at from the French perspective, it's, uh, it's not, it's not quite the same because they're looking over the whoop, they're looking over the Jura and then up from 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 Lake Geneva and again back to the Alps. The Italians, I mean it's it's Alpine, it's Alpine right down to the down to the Italian border. And I think one final point I forgot to mention that um, the from 1915 the uh, the Italian front with Austria was somewhere down here. It's at the Dreisprachenspitz, but I can't. It's somewhere down here, and I have to look up exactly where it is. Um, 
But had one of had one of the belligerents gone through here or or here, I think all that would have it would have served to do would be to link up the front there on the lag with uh, with that front through some horrific territory. I think that was probably a large reason why they didn't do it because it was useful to anchor 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 the flank um, and not have several hundred kilometres more front to, to to garrison and fight over in some really nasty terrain. So, anyway, I hope that was at least vaguely interesting. Thanks so much for watching if you survived this far. Sorry I rambled and went off on ram random tangents, but uh, I do this from memory. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thanks to all our patrons uh, who, who help us to support the channel. I mean, this kind of video just involves me coming up from, uh, from work one, one evening and uh, blathering away to camera. So this one's been a, a cheap one to produce. But uh, a lot of the shooting vids get quite expensive and we're investing quite a lot of time, effort and money into the channel. So thank you very much for all your support. And uh, if you haven't already become a patron, please consider doing so. And uh, see you again sometime. Bye.